Good evening. My name is Mac McCarter, Chair of Board of Trustees, and welcome to tonight's Clover School District Postpone Referendum Town Hall. Thank you for taking the time by attending in person or utilizing our live streaming link. The purpose for this meeting is to restart our partnership. This partnership consists of Clover School District, this community, and the Board of Trustees, which you elect and represents the bridge between the district and the community. This partnership has been and should always be based on trust and an overall understanding of how we continue to move this district forward so we can live up to each child each day excellence. The absence of direction and trust will not allow us to achieve the goal of what is best for every student of this district. We believe this is the first of many opportunities that will restart our focus and to address the positive challenges that are ahead for this district. Please allow, please allow me to an opportunity to introduce the Board of Trustees. Ms. Sherry Curlick, Ms. Ginger Marr, Ms. Jessica Cody, Ms. Tracy Stiff, Mr. Joe Gordon, and Mr. Rob Wallace. I would also like to take a moment to review the activities since the September referendum in 2021. A community survey was held on November 9th. Six community listening sessions were held across the district between the 16th and 18th of December. Updated school by school capacity and utilization review was completed on December 13th. Tonight will be the first of many interactive work sessions to develop a capital building plan our community can support and be proud of supporting. Thank you for attending, Dr. Quinn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Tonight, uh, I want to add my welcome. Uh, it is wonderful to see a good crowd here tonight, and we tried to have it in a big enough venue that you felt safe to spread out. And also, if you want to take your mask down and stay socially distanced, you can do that or leave your mask on. So thank you again. Also, to our folks who are joining with us uh, via our YouTube channel, we enjoy having that capability and hope that you will uh, in, be able to heat, see and hear everything that you need to tonight. This uh, will be archived on our website. So if you wanna go back and view any pieces of it, or if you have someone that wants to see it, you can let them know they can uh, go to our website and, and watch the entire uh, recorded video of tonight. So uh, if you're changed to the next slide, I wanna go over the agenda. Thank you very much. So tonight, what we are going to try to do uh, in terms of getting some of the work done towards moving towards the next building plan is we want to really focus in on what tonight's purpose is. And I'm going to go over that in our next slide. We also have tonight uh, a panel here that has worked with us throughout the last two years in developing a building plan for our district. And so members of the panel will be introduced in just a minute. And we're going to focus tonight on some of the critical initial steps that it takes to move forward with getting a building plan together. So the purpose of tonight will be to reset, as Mr. McCarter said. We want to focus on the justification for the need, because before we can begin to think about what projects and when, we have to make sure that our community understands what our growth issues are and the true need behind the ask that we are having for the community. We also know that you attended several listening sessions and you participated in our survey, and you may have some additional questions you would like for us to follow up. We are going to have an extensive Q&A session for interactivity tonight, and we have a place here at the front for you to come up and pose any question that you want to. We're going to ask that you try to focus your questions around the main issues we're working on tonight, which, which is justification of need, our enrollment, our growth, what the issues are around capacity in our district and where those pressure points are. But if you have other questions that you really are, are burning questions or things that you'd like to say, we certainly welcome you to do that during the question and answer period. Um, again, we will take those questions both from our live audience as well as from our audience who is uh, live streaming in. Dr. Hopkins, if you'll kind of wave where you are, he is monitoring our CSD communications uh, email site so that if questions come in, we can also address those. And now if you'll move to the next. I'd like to introduce our panel for tonight uh, so that you know who has been working with our district to get ready for our building construction and uh, capacity and enrollment studies. So I'll first introduce Ben Thompson. Ben, if you'll wave, please. Ben is K-12 Studio Director for McMillan, Pasden, Smith, and oversees all K-12 projects across seven offices. His firm was selected to assist the district on planning and designing of our new facilities. 
For those who don't know Macmillan, Pasden Smith, it, uh, it is an architecture firm that works throughout South Carolina on school design, and they've been doing that for more than 50 years. Ben is an architect and has spent 20 years planning, designing, and overseeing construction of educational projects. He is an accredited learning environments planner. For us, he aided in, in several aspects of the last couple of years. He has focused on our visioning for elementary and, and high school design. He has also worked with our enrollment and demographic data. Thank you, Ben. We also have with us virtually Dr. Dale Holden, and you can see his picture here. Dr. Holden could not be here tonight, but he did agree to live stream in, and so we hope we're gonna have no technical issues with him. Uh, Dr. Holden is an educational and corporate planning consultant whose company, H. Dale Holden and Associate, Associates specializes in the development of long range and staffing projections, school program capacity studies, and attendance area plans. Dr. Holden served as a teacher and a counselor and a regional program director for a five county educational consortium in Lancaster. He was named as the first certified strategic planner by the National Academy of School Executives. And he has really worked in Fort Mill and Clover throughout the last several bonds, but he's worked all over the state of South Carolina. We also have with us tonight Kelly Clayton. Kelly, if you will wave. Um, Mr. Clayton is a partner with the Leitner Management Group in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Prior to working with Leitner, Mr. Clayton was the program director with Cumming Corporation, headquartered in California. During the 16 years with Cumming, he was responsible for program management of large capital building programs for school districts and county governments in South Carolina. Mr. Clayton is a professional engineer, registered in three states and spent the first eight years of his professional career as a design engineer before crossing over into project management. He is a certified construction manager with the Construction Management Associations of America. And for the past 12 years, Mr. Clayton has worked in Clover School District with multiple building programs and capital expenditures. He was our program director for the last bond referendum, the 2014 bond, and was responsible for helping us complete the new elementary school, new middle school, and the renovations to the ninth grade campus on time and under budget. And then finally, uh, we also have Mr. Jim Britton. Jim, if you go wave. Uh, Mr. Britton is a recent retired partner with Cumming Corporations, an international project management and cost consulting firm. Uh, based out of the Fort, the Fort Mill office, he has completed approximately 2 billion in construction projects over the last 30 years and specializes in assisting K-12 owners with successful implement, implementation of multi-project building programs. So we thank this uh, panel, if you'll just give them a round of applause for taking time to join us in Clover tonight. All right, if you'll move to the next slide, let's go ahead and begin for tonight. Uh, we wanted to let you know these faces also go with names that you'll see on our district website. So over the last two years, 2019 to 2021, the district held over 28 planning sessions. Some of those were board work sessions. Some of those were day, half day long retreats. Some of those were interactive meetings with the community, but those were all preparation meetings to get ready for the bond referendum that we just proposed. And you will see the names of many of the panelists that you have here tonight because they helped us develop a lot of the artifacts that the board reviewed in that planning process. And I'll give you a few examples of those. So coming, sorry, moving around, coming corporation, for example, did our 2019 long range facility study where they walked every single one of our building and looked at every single maintenance need we would have for that building over the next 10 year period uh, to address some of that's deferred maintenance. Some of that was capacity and enrollment space. Dr. Dale Holden did three studies for us. One was a school by school capacity study where he walked every building and categorized those spaces of what the building is used for and how much room it has. He also did a demographic and enrollment study where he looked at our growth trends and he used a methodology to predict what our growth would be. He has done that for us several times and has been very, very accurate in that work as well as uh, Cumming Corporation as they were predicting growth. They have been very accurate in their predictions over the course of several years. And then finally, the last two things I'll share is uh, Ben Thompson with Macmillan Pasden Smith worked with the board on our elementary design and our high school design and has recently worked with us on project delivery methods for construction projects as well as looking at our enrollment and demographic. 
And then the board did a half day long retreat where they looked at six different options of how we could address the capacity and growth needs. And we've documented some of those. All of these studies you can find on our district website under the facilities tab, and you can see the exact presentations that were given at the time that they were given in those 28 board meetings that we had. So you have a very experienced audience, our panel here tonight. And so if you have questions, I want you to feel free to ask those to our members. And now let's go into our debrief from what we heard in our listening tour and our survey. So uh, we com in completing those two things, that was the first thing that the board asked the district to do uh, was to find out from the community what went well in the bond and what obviously did not go well in the bond. And so some of the key things that we heard was uh, that the ask was too big, particularly at this time uh, and where we are in um, the pandemic and in, the, in our country, that this was a big bond to ask for at this time. We also heard lots of questions about what is your capacity? Where do you have problems? How are you using your buildings? Is the, are these enrollment numbers accurate? And that, those two things right there, or that, or that bullet is so critical that tonight we're really going to focus hard on that question. Because we want to do bullet number three, identify if there truly is a district need for building construction. We also heard questions about delivery models and construction costs. And if that's a key issue that you had and you want to hear about, I want to invite you to be a part of both our February board work sessions, which will be interactive at our district office, as well as our March work sessions, because we're going to be delving into the current short term needs as well as the long term needs that we need to address and what those might cost. So I would just give you a heads up for those two meetings. And then finally, we heard questions about transparency and our process, how the district rolled the bond information out, how we communicated it to the public, and we got some very good suggestions on how to engage our public better, as well as questions about what funding sources were available to build schools. We are going to hit all of those issues over the course of the next five months. And again, we want our community to, to go on this journey with us. We've been down this road before, but with this time when we go down the road, we want to bring you along with us and to do that that we are going to ask you to take advantage of if you can't come to a to a board work session live stream in or if you can't live stream in go to the archive meetings and take a look you can watch it at your own time so we just want to do everything we can to make sure you're informed and a part of the process and so now for tonight tonight we're going to go into trying to reset about capacity and about enrollments and about where we have critical uh tight spots in our district. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dale Holden, who again is joining us virtually, and I hope it's going to work. <laughs> Good evening, folks. Uh, one of the things I'd like to do this evening is familiar, familiarize uh, you folks with the concept of building and program capacity. And I think you can see on this slide that uh, capacity figures can often be misleading because the types of instructional uses often changes from year to year. Uh, it takes into consideration teacher schedules, uh, particularly at the middle and high school levels. And obviously one of the components of this is the district's average class sizes, which you can see at the bottom of this slide. So the three things I wanna to touch on this evening are the concept of building and program capacities and give you some insights into the process that I used in doing the study that was presented to the district and the board of trustees in March of 2019. And then also to talk a little bit about the uh, results of that study. So along those lines, I wanna first of all touch on building capacity and I've got a slide that uh, I think will uh, show you uh, this idea. Uh, if we can bring up the building and right. Uh, in years past, uh, typically when a school was constructed, uh, the architects and the folks in the district often assign a capacity number to that particular school. And in some cases that number remained the same over multiple years. Uh, the whole concept behind building capacity, and if you look at the diagram on this slide, um, this is an example uh, that I put together of a uh, hallway in a typical elementary school uh, consisting of 10 classrooms. 
And if we looked at these the way capacity was looked at in the past, we would just take those 10 classrooms, multiply them by the number of uh, students, the average class size, and we come up with a building capacity of 220. Uh, this was done usually without regard for what was actually taking place in those classrooms. And over the years, uh, the whole concept of uh, capacity has evolved. And uh, at present, uh, it is focused more on what we call program capacity. And if you look at the slide on program capacity, uh, this is a little bit different approach. Uh, again, we still have the same uh, 10 spaces uh, and the average class sizes. Uh, uh, in many cases, if you look at what takes place in those classrooms does vary. Um, to give you an example, uh, in Clover, if one of these classrooms was designated as a uh, level one uh, self-contained special services classroom, uh, it may not uh, basically accommodate 22 students. It may only accommodate 12. But getting back to the example I'm, uh, that's on the slide, uh, in this case, if room 104 uh, is designated as a related arts technology lab, this is going to serve students typically from multiple uh, grade level classrooms that go to this room uh, to receive uh, computer related instruction. And so that uh, obviously no longer counts as 22. It really doesn't count at all in terms of program capacity. And then if you look at uh, room 109, uh, if that's designated as a reading recovery space, that also would not count in terms of the overall program capacity. So what program capacity takes into consideration is how these various spaces are actually being used. And in this case, we end up with eight regular grade level classrooms multiplied by the average class size of 22. And so our resulting program capacity uh, is 176. So we, in essence, have uh, reduced uh, that program capacity from what we previously might think of as building capacity from the 220 uh, to the 176. And so I think in one of the questions I often get is, well, how do you go about uh, actually determining program capacity at the school level? And what I have found over my 20 years of doing this as a consultant and previous to that, uh, doing the same type of work in Richland School District 2 is that you initially need to gather the pertinent data related to how uh, those spaces within the school are being used. And this includes not only classroom size spaces, but also uh, smaller spaces within the school that may be used for instruction. And uh, in looking at that, uh, what I typically do uh, with these studies is ask the district and the school level folks to initially provide me with a uh, floor plan for the school with the various sizes of the spaces designated. Uh, and also uh, included with that is identifying any grade level classrooms as well as uh, rooms that are being used for related arts, uh, special education or support staff functions. And then I look at what and who is assigned to each of these spaces and go about reviewing that prior to scheduling an on-site visit. And this is something that uh, I did in 2019 over the course of several days is schedule 
a meeting with each of the principals where we could sit down and go over the information that they had sent me, uh, look at each of the spaces and very specifically look at what kind of instruction is taking place within those spaces. And then following that conference with the principals, uh, the next step was an actual walkthrough uh, of the actual buildings. And once that is done, uh, all of that is blended into a program capacity report. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Quinn mentioned, you can look at that report online. Uh, this next chart is a one page of that report, uh, which shows you uh, as of 2019, the program capacities for uh, each of the elementary schools uh, and the current enrollments for those schools. And of course, the differential between those two figures is at that point in time, uh, the available program capacities. And if we move to the uh, middle school portion of that chart, uh, you can see that uh, at that point in time, uh, the total program capacity was 2,354 spaces. Uh, the enrollment was 1832 and the available capacity was the 522. And then if we move to the high school, uh, you can see uh, again, uh, the resulting program capacities, the current enrollments, uh, as well as the available capacities. And uh, at this point in time, obviously, you know, this study uh, is three years old. And as you might expect, things have changed in three years. Uh, particularly in two main areas. One of those areas uh, relates to the average class sizes. Uh, back when this study was done, the average class sizes at the elementary level for pre-kindergarten through grade four was 20. Uh, grades five through 12, uh, the average class size was 25. Uh, currently, uh, these figures for average class sizes have been updated, uh, particularly at the elementary level where the average class size is 25 for kindergarten, uh, 22 for grades uh, one through five uh, with the designated uh, exception for Title I schools where the average class size uh, is 20 for grades one through five. And I, th I think as you might expect, this definitely has an impact on the overall program capacity figures, uh, particularly at the elementary level, uh, has less of an impact at the middle and high school levels because the average class size, size remained unchanged from what it was three years ago. Um, I think the other thing that has changed since 2019 is how certain instructional spaces are now being used and in turn how they're counted for uh, program capacity purposes. Um, if as an example in uh, 2019 uh, you were looking at a fifth grade classroom with an average class size of 25 and then three years later uh, it was determined based on student need that the best use for that space was to uh, utilize it for uh, a level two self-contained special service program where the average class size was 12. And so you've got uh, that difference or in essence, an overall reduction from 22 to 12 for that one classroom. And so those are some of the things that are impacted uh, in terms of uh, the overall program capacity figures. I think to the district's credit, you know, I think they saw the need to look at uh, some of these changes in more detail. And that I think is where uh, it is important that the work that I did has been updated 
with the study that uh, Kelly Clayton and his folks uh, produced earlier this year. Uh, and he will share uh, some of those details with you uh, in the forthcoming uh, discussions. But I think in, to be very specific, the whole idea of program capacity is an essential component of looking at districts overall uh, space that they have available for uh, instruction at all three levels. And uh, uh, this, uh, again, hopefully has provided you with some insight as to uh, why these figures have changed, why it is important, and uh, uh, really a precursor to uh, what you will hear about in terms of the updated program capacity study. So at this point, I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Clayton and let him take it from there. Greetings. Thank you, Mr. Holden, for uh, that work that you've done. That really is the baseline for us beginning to really talk about utilization uh, and capacity uh, at these at these facilities uh, here in Clover School District. Uh, one of the things that we do in connection with Dale's work is really try to then understand what is it that the school district needs out of their facilities. This will eventually lead to space, space programming, analysis of each of your existing buildings, and our true understanding of how those buildings are used both now and in the future. Uh, so you can see on the screen, uh, that's the establishment of, of those standards. Uh, we look at each type of facility, whether it be an elementary school facility, a middle school facility, uh, or a high school facility, because each one of them has different parameters. So we look at those standards so that we can judge apples to apples. How is that building performing from a capacity standpoint, of course, and a utilization uh, standpoint overall? Uh, so Dale's work has led us into really looking at each one of those uh, each one of those facilities, uh, and it does take uh, a matter of going out into the field, as Dale mentioned, uh, putting boots on the ground to make sure that we understand how those buildings are being used, how those spaces are every single space in those schools is is being used. So if we look at a parameters at a standard, uh, starting at the elementary school uh, level. What Dale said was so very important, and I just want to say it one more time, is that his original study uh, really looked at an elementary school typical core classroom at a 1 to 20 uh, student to teacher ratio. Uh, we know that, and as the district has grown uh, over, over the years, over the last several years, uh, that space is running out at the elementary school level. So one of the adjustments that we made as part of looking at this segment of the parameter of this segment of the standard uh, was to bump that up to 1 to 25. So student teacher ratio of 1 to 25 in a general core classroom uh, for first uh, through uh, fifth grade overall. Um, you can see here also there are a lot of other pieces and components that go into each one of these uh, facilities. It's really important that we understand it from a size uh, standpoint, whether that be a uh, under 600 uh, enrollment uh, school or whether that be uh, 600 to 900 in the case of uh, this school district and certainly anything that's over 900 would have different parameters uh, as well. Uh, going into the middle school uh, side of it, uh, elementary schools uh, operate in one way. Middle schools are that link between uh, elementary and high schools in many ways from a capacity and utilization standpoint. So as we look at middle schools, those standard figures uh, change. In this case, uh, all core classrooms are that 1 to 25 uh, value. So you can uh, truly see how each one of those spaces uh, can have that enrollment uh, capacity that Dale is mentioning uh, through the course of his work. Uh, looking back again at um, uh, at this graph, you know, one thing that I would point out uh, to not only in, in, in middle schools, but also in all uh, types of schools is that you have special education uh, needs, you have itinerant program needs. Each one of those has its own uh, type of capacity. Uh, a 1 to 25 capacity might not work for a special education classroom. So we apply a different figure there and that does affect your overall building capacity, your overall program capacity uh, at the end of the day. Uh, moving on to high schools, just to briefly open up this standard. 
uh, look is that when we look at the high schools, uh, they are truly uh, a, a different kind of uh, animal than a middle school or an elementary school. You have multiple types of uh, classes being offered. Uh, you have multiple schedules going on uh, at any given time. So really taking a hard look at how Clover High School, for instance, works and operates was really part of this study and the update to uh, Dale's uh, reporting. Here uh, we looked at the, we used a 1 to 25 uh, student to teacher ratio again uh, and looked at all of the spaces that could accommodate that uh, those those courses, those those classrooms, those core academics uh, overall. In addition to those uh, academics, you do have uh, again special education. Uh, some of those, uh, some of those uh, intervention programs, those itinerant programs uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, and so that forms the basis of how we kind of look at the standard overall, not for every school district, but specific here to uh, Clover County School District or Clover County Schools. Um, there is a lot of data in this in this reporting. Uh, I'll I'll try I'll try to give just an overview of how we standardize these things. So again, we look at apples to apples. Uh, but what we're going to do tonight is actually apply those to each one of your schools. So I'm going to ask Kelly Clayton to really go into those details so that we can again look at how that affects each one of your schools, each one of your facilities now and into the future. Kelly. Try to take this off if I can. So I can move around a little bit. So thank you, Ben and Dr. Holden for. For the intros and really, uh, as has been said, um, we were tasked with just revisiting the schools to make sure we maximized space use. Uh, we wanted to to go back and, and build upon Dr. Holden's work and um, make sure that every school we were maximizing every space at every school based on the feedback that we got during the bond campaign. And so we we went back, um, visited every school, met with every principal, um, measured every room verified how that space was being used and, and applied the standard that was developed um, for parity across the district to make sure every elementary school was being utilized and operated the same way. And so by doing so, um, it gave a, an even account of, of capacity, uh, program capacity. And um, what we're going to do now is just show you some of the work that we have. we're not going to talk about every school tonight as far as capacity. We're going to give you some examples of, of the work that we did to to verify and to to update those capacity numbers. The first one is is Bethany Elementary, and this is a floor plan of, of Bethany. And so what we did was color coded all of the spaces in the school. Um, to designate. Capacity generating spaces versus non capacity generating spaces, and that will. Um, that's explained in Dr. Holden's study as well. Um, but really, if you see a shade of green on the map, then that tells you that that is a capacity generating space. So whether it be a general classroom, a special ed classroom, a pre-K or a kindergarten room, each one of those had different ratios. That's why they're colored a different green, but still they're a shade of green, which indicates that it is a capacity generating space. The orange is just your related arts. Those are required courses. Uh, but you, there are also a minimum number of those that you have to have. Um, so those are identified in orange. Your science labs are in brown. So those are dedicated lab space for those grade levels. And then the blue is your resource support space that's needed for intervention and um, resource needs. OK, so when you do that across the board, at this point, it's just it's doing, it's doing the math, applying the ratios that were standardized to those green spaces to, to calculate the capacity, which is really the same methodology that Dr. Holden used in his report. Um, and with that, I want to let um, Principal Guerin speak a little bit about her school at Bethany. Uh, she's the principal at Bethany Elementary. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Margaret Guerin. I'm the principal at Bethany Elementary School. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, so as you can see on this map, we utilize every space that we can. Um, Bethany, a couple years ago when the capacity study was done, we were averaging around 385, 386 students. Um, our enrollment today was 405. So we have grown some. We are not um, nearly the growth rate as other parts of the district, but we do have growth in our area. 
Um, and with that, we are running out of space or really truly have already run out of space. So a couple of things um, to point out here. Um, the, the ones shaded in brown actually are classrooms. Um, so one of those is a second grade teacher that is in a building, a classroom in the middle of the building, no windows, um, because that was the space that we had. Um, the other one is our kitchen, which is right next to that big square here that you can see um, in our cafeteria area. And currently with our COVID protocols, we can seat 42 students in there. So as you can imagine, um, that provides a lot of problems for us. Um, so they run from about 1015 till after one o'clock. Um, and we have to have a rotation of students in the cafeteria and students eating in the classroom because we just cannot physically fit the number of our students in our classroom. I mean, in our cafeteria, excuse me. Um, so as you can see, we're using every space, nook, cranny, closet um, that we can. And with our new study, um, we are very close within just a couple of students of reaching our capacity. So there is a great need for science labs for our students. We do not have any of those at Bethany for especially our third, fourth, and fifth grade students and more classroom space because we have a couple grade levels that are approaching that number or have already surpassed that number of that ratio that we're looking for. So um, we need more space. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will also point out that uh, Ms. Garen actually uses a vestibule as a support space. So this is really a back entry into her media center. So she's literally using every square inch of the school that she can. Um, so the next school that we're going to look at is Oak Ridge Elementary. As you all know, that's on the, the uh, Lake Wiley Eastern side of the district. Now, this school, again, same color scheme. If it's green, it's a capacity generating space, um, related arts, science labs, and resource support space. So same methodology. Um, same ratio, same calculations, but by applying the, the standard that was developed to Oak Ridge, we actually had an increase in Oak Ridge's capacity of somewhere around 125, 130 kids. So uh, that 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 helps district wide capacity wise, but it certainly um, uh, doesn't make Ms. Masco very happy with what she's having to deal with. So next, I, I'll let uh, I'll let Ms. Masco talk a little bit about Oak Ridge Elementary. Good evening and thank you for attending tonight to learn more information about the bond referendum discussion and planning for future facilities in Clover School District. I'm Lori Masco and I'm the principal at Oak Ridge Elementary School. I wanted to share with you just a brief summary of how our school has grown over the past six years since opening during the 1617 school year. When our school opened in August of 2016, our enrollment was 640 students. As of today, our current enrollment is 810 students, which is an increase of 170 students in a six year period. We actually have three new students enrolling on Monday. We currently have two remaining classrooms that are not occupied by a homeroom teacher on a daily basis, and those will be occupied next school year as we continue to grow. Additionally, we opened in 2016 with four teachers per grade level and we need six teachers per grade level next year in grades K through five, which will ultimately put our school at full capacity by the end of the 2022 or 22, 23 school year. When deciding whether to vote for or against the referendum, please keep the growth of our school along with the remainder of the district in mind so we can continue to provide a quality education for all students. Thank you, Ms. Masco. Um, so really applying the same methodology through the remaining um, five elementary schools to, to come up with the capacities that we'll show you at the end of this, uh, what those new capacities are. So we're not gonna go through the, the other five elementary. So the next one, just uh, we'll talk about Oak Ridge Middle, uh, which is also on the Eastern side, uh, Lake Wally area. Uh, this is the floor plan of Oak Ridge, uh, Oak Ridge Middle. And as you can see, the the green again is your core academic spaces. Uh, the ratios at the middle school are the same as the high school, 25 to one, uh, which is <clears throat> the same ratios that Dr. Holden was using. The difference here is that um, we color coded the related arts um, and the uh, resource support spaces. Uh, the difference being here that we calculated the capacity here 
based on just the core academic areas. Uh, so it's a slight difference between what we did and what Dr. Holden did um, using a factor ratio. Um, and we did that because really the, the way the building was set up was that you have, based on the schedule, uh, four teams of four, which would be 16 classrooms per wing. So sixth grade, I believe, is the middle, right? Mr. Largent, and then seventh, and then eighth, I believe is right. So each wing has uh, four teams of four with three general classrooms and a science lab. And that's the way uh, Clover Middle was designed and built as well. Uh, so when you, uh, again, applying the, the formula and the standards um, that were developed, 16, 16 general classrooms per wing, times three wings, 48 classrooms, 25 per class, so you get 1,200. Add to that your special needs areas, and that's your capacity. Okay, so that's slightly different than what you will see in, in Dr. Holden's report, but uh, that's how we were able to increase the capacity at Oak Ridge slightly. And I'll let Mr. Largent, principal of Oak Ridge Middle, talk a little bit about his school. Good evening, everyone. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Will Largent, the principal of Oak Ridge Middle School. And some things we have done as far as first, I'll you tell you the growth. We opened Oak Ridge uh, 13 years ago. It was roughly 800 students. I, I pulled our attendance numbers right before I came here this evening, and we're at 1,203. So we are at capacity. Every bit, every space you see at Oak Ridge is used right now. And the really not only about growth, but also the programs and the offerings that we offer our kids is what's been a challenge for us. So I just want to tell you some things we've done in the last couple of years to meet the needs of our students. It was more about the meeting the needs of our students, and we found the space. Um, first off, the two blue areas right there were computer labs. Uh, we switched those, uh, obviously going to one to one. We didn't need those computer labs, so we split those two rooms in half for resource classrooms. And so now those are four resource classrooms and they are used every day. So that was a good use of our space. Um, I will say for our band, our band class, our band classroom, uh, we, we have uh, three periods where it is uh, percussion and brass together. And when our percussion teacher comes over, we don't have a space for our percussion class now. So our percussion class meets on the stage every day. And so if you have lunch at middle school students, when percussion class is going on, it's, well, they get, they get claps every day, especially from our sixth graders, but it's kind of tough teaching percussion class on, on stage every day. Also something that, that we did first because of COVID, we split, our, split normally in middle schools, and uh, Mr. Cartwright does this at Clover Middle as well. There are three lunch periods, a grade level lunch. Well, if we took our eighth grade to lunch now, there's 430 kids. They wouldn't all fit in our cafeteria, so we split our lunches in half. Uh, that also helps with COVID for social distancing, but it's also purely a space issue as well. Um, also in our media center, uh, we have we had three little small rooms that were, I guess, designed to begin with probably to be reading or quiet areas. Well, we've converted all three of those areas now. Two of those are office spaces, uh, one for our social worker and one for our speech therapist, and then we also have a a study hall that we force students to go to and we have a TA that is a certified teacher that does that class and so that third classroom is now a study hall and so we don't have those extra spaces in our media center so we've used those spaces again to meet the needs of our students. We also have four people that share an office now. Uh, some folks that are not in the building every day. Uh, I think it was appropriate that we put two folks in one office and two folks in another office. So we do have people that are sharing office space now. Um, the last thing we had to do, uh, which was a great, again, to meet the needs of our students, my conference room, the conference room right beside my office is now a Catawba Mental Health Counselor's classroom and she meets with students three days a week and my used to be conference room is now an office space. Um, and the other thing that we're looking at for the future now, and I don't think that's been decided yet with our program offerings for the related arts area, our numbers are so large that we need more related arts. And if we get more related arts positions for next year, then they have to have a classroom somewhere. And so there's talk of possibly mobile units next year. I don't know if that's gonna happen or not, but we do have a nice area between the school and Highway 557. It's a nice soccer field too at the time, but uh, uh, that is something that will have to be looked at for the future as well for new pro, again, to meet the needs of our students more uh, upgrade related arts activities for our students. Thank you. 
Okay, and then lastly, to wrap up, we look at uh, high school, the high school campus, and um, well, we're going to look at this <clears throat> as a as a high school campus, both ninth grade academy and ninth grade campus and the high school itself, as well as the applied technology centers. Both of those all contribute to total capacity, and so. Um, Looking at Mr. Ruth's school, uh, you can see we, we did the same thing, walked it, measured it, verified classroom sizes to make sure they meet minimum standards, uh, and then applied the, the program standard to it. Um, high schools are a little tricky, as Dr. Holden alluded to, uh, but same methodology applies uh, that he did. Um, this is the main level um, at, the, at the high school. Um, next floor should be second floor, or do we go, Ryan? Okay, so we now this is an ATC. So this is ATC um, C, the new one, and you see a lot of brown there because these are just uh, lab shop areas for the um, tech programs, uh, ag tech, um, automotive technology, those type spaces. So uh, they're in their lecture. This is your capacity generating spaces, and they go to lab. Uh, then the other ATC B, same scenario: shops, labs, and classroom spaces. And the second level of the high school, you see how many classrooms they have and then how many special education rooms. And then we quickly breeze through the lower level. So this is the 3400 3, wing lower level with the course wing and the uh, below us, the band room for this, for the high school is actually below us behind uh, this building. And then just running through ninth grade campus, this is main level applying the same standard program to it. Um, next, lower level, and then third level. Um, so again, simply going in, uh, counting those academic spaces, applying the ratios, and factoring in the schedule that the school operates on uh, to determine the capacity. Um, with that, I'll let Dr. Uh, Mr. Ruth, not a doctor, uh, uh, speak about Clover High. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm going to go over very quickly just five components that I want to describe about Clover High School. We'll talk about enrollment first, just to kind of get an idea. Once again, my name is Rod Ruth, the principal at Clover High School. I've been there for seven years now, extremely proud principal of that institution. In those seven years, so when I arrived, our 45 day report for enrollment, um, we had 2,190 students at Clover High School on the 45th day. Um, this year on our 45th day, we had 2,617 students. So around uh, a little over 420 students added over those seven years. And for me to provide it with some context, I came from Lake City, South Carolina, working at Lake City High School. That's a 3A high school in South Carolina. So over those seven years, we've added half the population of a 3A high school to Clover High School over that time, just to kind of provide a little context with it. Uh, we currently have 2,508, and you're probably wondering where do those 2,600 students go? We graduate in December. Uh, this year, we graduated 100 seniors through early graduation, through winter graduation, I should say, and those numbers have grown as we've seen the growth in the school in general. So 100 uh, winter grads this year, around 80 last year, 80 the year before that, 70 the year before that. So we've seen a steady climb in that. We hover around the fifth to eighth largest uh, school in South Carolina, uh, most years within that range. Uh, so that's one as it relates to enrollment. To talk about room availability, uh, we maximize all of our space to the best of our ability at Clover High School for a variety of reasons. But for next year, I would like to add around seven teachers to uh, Clover High School. See, when, when high schools grow, you have to think about it in the context that they're going to be taking multiple classes and not just one. So the growth model looks a little different. We need uh, seven teachers for next year for growth so that we can add electives, some of those high interest electives for our students to give them the best experience possible and to reduce our study hall numbers. And so to find those seven spaces, as you've kind of seen the, the map here, some things we'll have to consider include, um, you know, the removal of a study hall room, a math collaboration space, um, a wrestling team meeting room, a special education storage and sorting room for our partnership with the Eagles Closet, a special education sensory room, special education industrial arts room. If you've ever gotten anything from the the best room or anything like that, ordered anything from our students in that program, 
uh, that industrial arts room as well, where they'll do that. Now, that doesn't mean that we would give up on those programs by any stretch. What it means is we have to consider those spaces as we try to accommodate for the growth of new staff members in order to reduce study hall numbers, provide electives, and for just general growth. So we'll talk about study hall just a bit, and study hall exists on the 10th uh, through 12th grade, the main campus portion. This school year, uh, 10th through uh, 12th grade, we'll have 1,110 students in study hall. That's an average of 78 students per class per semester. We looked at the ratios, those 20 to ones and 25 to ones, we're at 78 to one for the first semester in study hall for those classes. Today, we had 234 students in study hall, enrolled in study hall today. In the next nine weeks, we'll have 253 students enrolled in study hall. And our study hall proctors do an unbelievable job. And uh, many of our students need a little bit of extra time but most of the time it's because of our lack of electives that we can offer during that time and some of our constraints that students have to be put in study hall. Let's talk about parking and our um, drop off and pick up for a second. Collective groan comes across just now, I apologize. We have 700, excuse me, voice is going a little bit, 747 total parking spots on our campus. We could have 1,900 drivers. Now, we don't have 1,900 drivers, but eligible drivers, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. We have 747 spots that typically sell out at registration each year. Among those 747, 221 are in the gravel lot. Uh, 34 are behind ATCB, 128 behind ATCC. So a school our size has 329 student parking lots in the general parking area and then we get very creative in finding spots around campus in order to provide those additional spots to get to 747 uh, spots so um, obviously parking becomes an issue uh, some of the things that you may not see necessarily in the numbers and again i love clover high school um, you know my life my family were so dedicated to it um, but um, it's a, a two A, three A school that has just really, really grown. And so some of the areas you may not see, the traffic pattern in the morning uh, and in the afternoon where we have, you know, multiple, coming from multiple directions can be pretty tough. Uh, the car line in the afternoon, it takes roughly 20 minutes from when school dismisses in order to get everyone off of campus in the front. So about 20 minutes there, which isn't too bad. But what ends up happening, because we don't have enough parking decals for students, or it becomes kind of cumbersome to get through the car rider line, we do have a number of students and parents that will seek other places for pickup. So we have students that will walk and walk to other locations as a result of that, and that is not optimal. Um, some of the other spaces where we have issues, the ELA and world language classrooms, um, we really can't add a lot of additional students in those classes because they're just built uh, much smaller than some of our other classrooms. The hallways, so it's a 2A, 3A high school hallway, and so we have issues during the transition of class. And as a result of that, we have to have students that have to go outside across the front of campus, and that's not optimal either. Ideally, your transition from class to class is all within a hallway and not outside. We have no common or flexible space for our students. Uh, if you've been into Clover High School, and again, very fortunate to have the building that we do, but if you've been in Clover High School, the only space where students could congregate is in front of the media center, which is a pretty small space given the number of students that we have on the main campus. Um, we currently run 10 lunches between two cafeterias um, for uh, space reasons. Um, some of the other things that um, we have to make considerations for, currently in our fourth block, weight training class, we have 86 students and 12 racks in our weight room. And so it doesn't quite meet the need of the student population that we have right now. So once again, um, we're very fortunate. Uh, I've moved from another part of the state and seen the outstanding job that's done in York County. Um, but I do think through some, um, some decision making and things like that, we can even rise to another level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ruth. And uh, not to not to steal uh, 
Dr. Quinn's thunder later on, but I think one of the things that Mr. Ruth is going to be faced with with those teacher additions, if he gets them, uh, is he may have to spill over into the ninth grade campus, um, which is you know trying to be isolated from the high school. So um, I think your school was built in 1976, which I think it's had three or four major additions since then to keep up with the needs of the high school level. So really, those core facilities that Mr. Ruth was talking about is what's really getting stressed. So, in summary, uh, where, where did we land? So here, here's a comparison of the 2019 uh, study that Dr. Holden did with an updated capacity based on the, the work that we just did, uh, walking the schools and applying the program standards. So you can see we, had, we ended up with a net increase at the elementary level of 200 seats. So that helps buy a little time uh, at the elementary level. Um, not much with the growth that you just heard, but um, but it does help. Uh, and then when you look at the middle school uh, and high school levels, middle school had a net increase of, of 100 uh, with the program standards, uh, but the high school actually had a had a net decrease, um, mainly because of some combined rooms, some some rooms that had to be combined for his study hall, and. Um, some program use that had changed over three years, and then there was a, a pretty big increase in the special education needs at the high school, which would drop your ratios. So anyway, uh, in total, uh, 10,522 is the current uh, updated capacity for the entire district, leaving the remaining seats of about 600, 1,600. Now, keep in mind the district's growing on average of 260 kids per year uh, for the last five years. So in roughly five to six years time, there's there's not gonna be an available seat. So, I think that's it. And so what are the key takeaways on capacity? We've spent a lot of time on that because that was one of the real central questions of, do you really have a space issue in Clover School District? And so the key takeaways we want you to, to have from this is three of our schools went down in capacity, uh, Bethany, Lauren, and Clover High School. But six of our schools, we actually found additional found additional space. We categorized additional space. And so you can see we've got a little more room, we think, to last a little longer at Bethel, Crowders, Griggs, Kynard, Oak Ridge Elementary, Oak Ridge Middle, and Clover Middle. The issue is that some of those schools on that list are already at that capacity. Some of them aren't, but some of them are. Overall, the elementary capacity picked up 200 seats. Most of that was at Oak Ridge Elementary School, but she's going to take those, uh, the 100 seats we found there, and she will be at capacity with her six uh, teachers per grade level next year. Uh, Oak Ridge Middle School will be as, as well uh, at capacity. The seats available are at Clover Middle, and you'll see that in just a minute when we really look at Clover Middle, and then the high school, as we said, decreased due to special education spaces and some uh, study hall spaces. So if you can keep those takeaways in mind, we'll move now to enrollment. And we wanna show you what's been trending in each of these schools, because we did a school by stud school study of enrollment as well. So I'll turn it over to the next portion of this to begin enrollment. And I think I'm up first. So the first thing I wanna say about enrollment is you hear all the time uh, different numbers that we tell you what our enrollment is. That's because every day someone moves in or moves out. So if we talked about enrollment every day, we could give you different numbers. But for there are two points in the school year that we track enrollment and the state actually verifies our enrollment and it ties to our funding. So we have to be extremely accurate in those two reports. It's the 135 day report, which you can see a red line that's reflecting the 135 day. And then it's the 45 day report. 135 day happens in March. And if you think about it, we report to the state the number of students we have so that they can fund us for the next school year. And then what happens over the summer? We get a lot of new kids in Clover School District. We grow about 230 to 250 kids per year over the, some of that's over the summer. And so the 45th day in October is that confirmation of, okay, no, we need additional funding because we have grown. The only thing I want you to take away from this slide is those th those day, those uh, two reports are very close to one another. So they are, when, when, if we're using the 45 day to predict or the 135 day predict, there's not a tremendous difference. However, at the elementary level, the best predictor is the 135th day because kids come all year long at the elementary level. But if we're looking at the high school, the best predictor is the 45th day for two reasons. 
Mamas and daddies move their high school kid at the beginning of the school year because they're earning credits. If they can possibly come in the summer, we get the biggest entry in the summer. So the beginning of the school year, 45th day, is a more accurate number. And we have a mid-year graduation where 100 or so kids leave after December. But we have to plan for them in first semester. So sometimes you're going to see us saying, hey, look at that 135th day line. And sometimes look at that 45th day line. And it depends on which school. And both are valid. And so I just want to make sure that's clear so that you don't think we're playing a bait and switch when we talk about the two different 135th day predictors and 45th day predictors. Now, Dr. Holden is going to talk about how we predict growth in our district. First of all, I want to share with you, first of all, I want to share with you a little bit about the background of enrollment projections. Obviously, in conjunction with what you've heard related to program capacities, uh, projected enrollments uh, are of equal importance. And there are several methodologies that are typically used for enrollment projection purposes. One of these is uh, a uh, methodology called linear regression analysis. Uh, the second is cohort survival methodology. And the third is students per housing unit. And in some cases, it is important uh, to take some elements from uh, more than one of these methodologies and combine them to get a more accurate view of the predicted enrollment projections. And I think you will see the value of that in some of the subsequent discussions where basically uh, in the case of the school district, um, there is a combined uh, approach to utilizing cohort survival methodology as well as some of the elements in terms of students per housing unit. Uh, the most recent projection that I did for the district in March of 2021, um, and this was a study that was presented to the district and the Board of Trustees in April. Uh, the uh, projections uh, were five-year projections using cohort survival methodology. And I want to give you a little bit of an explanation of how that works. Uh, if you, for example, have 100 students in grade three, uh, the cohort survival ratio as those students move to grade four, if all 100 move from th grade three to grade four, you have a survival ratio of 1.0. Uh, if in the case of a growing district like Clover, uh, if those 100 students move to grade four and because of increases in enrollment, uh, you actually end up with 108 students in grade four, then the survival ratio is 1.08. Uh, basically, the cohort survival methodology uh, utilizes multiple years of historical enrollments uh, combined with birth rates uh, in the district to project uh, enrollments in the case of the study that I did uh, for the next five years. I think it's also important to note that uh, the 2021 study, as well as the previous ones that I did for the district, focused on grade level enrollment projections for the district overall, and then looked at these also in terms of grade group, uh, the K-5, the 6-8, the 9 through 12. Uh, and I think the uh, additional feature that you see uh, on this chart as far as the projected enrollments is the fact that the pre-kindergarten students uh, based on this year's enrollment have been added uh, to the overall projections for students in grades K through 12. Uh, one of the things that's important to me as I do this type of work is to look at uh, how accurate these enrollment projections actually end up to be. 
And uh, in the case of the district, uh, looking at the enrollment projections for 21, 22, and then looking at the actual enrollments, uh, I was pleased to see that uh, the actual difference between actual and projected was approximately 50 students. So uh, hopefully that trend will continue in terms of the projections for uh, the next four years. Um, the thing that you will see if you look at the 2021 enrollment projection report is that there is a section that deals with residential development summaries. And this is something in a growing district uh, that takes on added importance uh, based on the fact that if you look at the developments that are underway, both in the town of Clover and the unincorporated areas of York County, uh, these in effect can be important features of looking at the enrollment projections. And unlike what many folks uh, look at when they see a 400 uh, home development uh, coming uh, into reality uh, is the number of students that that uh, development will actually bring to the district. And I think one of the advantages of the district is you have the benefit of some work that was done by Carson Vice uh, during the discussions about uh, impact aid. And one of the things that his study includes uh, is a set of calculations called uh, uh, student generation rates. And you'll see a little bit of this uh, in some of the discussion that follows. But I think the important thing uh, is that uh, these enrollment projections that you see on the chart uh, demonstrate uh, the fact that this district is going to continue to grow uh, at a fairly rapid rate for a district this size. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a somewhat different growth rate than uh, uh, your neighboring district, uh, uh, York 1, and also the Fort Norrell district uh, uh, figures. Uh, one district obviously will be expected to be growing at a less rapid rate, and the other one at a much more accelerated rate than uh, you folks will be uh, uh, growing in the uh, years to come. And so, uh, again, I'm not going to uh, bore you with the details. Uh, those of you that uh, uh, want to delve into this in much greater detail, uh, I would recommend that you take a look at the 2021 report and uh, also review some of the uh, figures that were presented here this evening. Thank you, Dr. Holden. Um, I think next is uh, to take a look at the plan development. So another another tool or another predictor that, that we often use um, to help supplement uh, Dr. Holden's work, as well as the historical numbers that we're gonna see shortly, is to look at the construction activity in the district, right? You, you can't just ignore what's going on around you. Um, especially in, in Clover, where a lot of the development is really just getting underway. Um, and so you, we, we take a look at the development that's, that's planned and apply the student generation rates based on the housing demographic in Clover School District. Um, those student, student generation rates uh, were reported in the Tischler Bice study in 2019. And so by getting an accurate count of the approved planned units or planned developments in Clover School District, we can apply those student generation rates to give us another tool, another, another indicator of what the growth, is, the expected growth is going to be. Um, but again, you have to use that as, as more of a supplementary because it doesn't take a lot of the historical data into context. So it's just another tool to look at. And so what you're seeing here is an updated uh, plan development map uh, for the Clover School District, the unincorporated areas of York County. Um, as you can see, most of the growth, 
The majority of the growth is obviously on the eastern side of the district, Lake Wiley area. Um, next slide. This is a total of the plan, de uh, plan developments that have been approved for, by York County uh, in, this, in the district. And so this is the counts that we're looking at. Uh, over 3,000 units that have been approved by the county for, um, for development in Clover School District, as well as the projected year of completion. Okay. Uh, we also have the data for the town of Clover. Um, plan, plan units that have been approved for town of Clover are 551 remaining. Now, for the purposes of the study that, that we did, the projections that we did, we did not include the Bradbury Park or the Tom Joy Road because those were still sort of in planning. Uh, but uh, they, so these are potential potential units. Uh, so we did we did not take those into account. We ignored those. Um, and then next. And then district wide, so this is what it looks like uh, on the district wide map. Um, the number of units that are coming to each school attendance zone. And Dr. Quinn, you want to? I'll just say uh, we use this map many times in our town halls that we've done before, um, but it really is telling when you can see that the three on the eastern side, the Bethel School Zone, 1,200 units, Crowder's over 1,000, Oak Ridge Elementary School, 369 units. All of those three feed into Oak Ridge Middle School, which is already at 12, over 1,200 students. So there is an impact to our elementaries, but there's also an impact to that middle school. And then the four other elementary schools schools on the western side or middle to western side all feed into Clover Middle School. And so you have to add all those up to see the impact there. And then, of course, all of those feed into the high school and the high school is already over 2600 students. So the plan developments, again, you can't say that there's going to be a student that moves into every one of those homes. It doesn't work that way. And that was what the Tischler by study that Dr. Holden just referenced. And I think it, this will zero in uh, if you will do that for me. Yes. So what he determined, and this was real data from Clover School District. This was not just a mathematical study. We had to geocode every single child and what type of house they live in. And that produced an ability to predict a single family home will produce this portion of a, of a student. And so if you look at single family home and you look at the elementary level for each single family home, there's a 0 0.207 student for middle 0 0.101 and high school 0 0.123. And then single family overall, that's that 0 0.431 impact. So when you start looking at 3,000 homes coming, 5,000 homes coming, you have to know, is it a single family? Is it a townhome, multifamily, or is it a mobile home? And then you have to apply those mathematical calculations to determine what is going to be the real student impact on that. And we have done that, and we know by school predictively what we can expect for each of these schools. Uh, so and you'll see that in the next couple of slides, so I won't steal, steal Mr. Good. Clayton's thunder on that. Okay, so um, so then diving into what those projections are, really, uh, what, what everyone's here to see tonight, right? Uh, so this is a, a graph, a chart, just showing what the um, previous five-year enrollments were, both the 135 and the 45 day numbers. Okay, those are actual historical numbers for the previous five years, and those were the numbers that were used to average, take the average of the last five years and use it to project forward for the 135 and the 45 day lines. That's your purple lines, your historical averages. <coughs> uh, Dr. Holden's projections, the cohort survival method, that's what you see in green. And then the orange line, which is the, these colors, by the way, are uh, the same um, charts that we that were in the previous study in 2019, so that you can go back and, and compare. Um, but the orange line also shows the planned developments that we just spoke of. So taking the number of units that are planned for Clover School District and applying those student generation rates um, from the Tisha Bly study, you get a projection on the planned developments. So uh, you also notice that the capacity increase that we just that we went over previously. Can I just do a takeaway on that one? So basically the purple lines say if you grow Clover School District like you'd have the last five years in the 45th day numbers or the 135th day numbers, your growth rate is going to be more like those purple lines. Just factoring in the, the, the plan development is just another way to look at that. The plan development is also going to produce some growth and that is that line. We're going to be we we are going to be somewhere in the middle of that 
to closer to one of those, we're not sure, but that's why we have multiple lines on the slide. They help inform where we're going to be. And so that's why we look at more than one data point. And I just wanted to make sure we make that clear. Absolutely. And so the next slide is we're basically, this is the current year where we are right now. The 8856 is the 45 day number for this school year. Uh, so taking the next slides and, and looking forward from this year forward by grade level, um, it looks like this at the elementary level. Okay. So uh, elementary grade level, there's your capacity that we talked about earlier, 4959, uh, the 135 line, the 45 day with the plan developments and then the cohort survival method. So you can see that it actually, with the increase in capacity, um, we actually gained a couple of two, uh, couple of years on the elementary school. I think the, uh, we were previously talking about a 24, 25 school year. Now it's somewhere in the 26, 27 school year. Okay. To run out of space. To run out of every seat. And that doesn't address what's going on at Oak Ridge and, and as we'll Ms. see. Billy, I see your hand coming up. We're getting ready to do Q and A. So do you um, uh, 30, 20, 30 minutes, maybe 20, 30 minutes, perhaps longer. You asked how much longer? Uh, sure, go ahead. We're getting to that. That's going to be a slide coming up. Right. Okay. Thank you for that question. And I, there's a slide coming up that will answer that so you won't have to wait for very long. Thank you. Okay, and, and so this is the elementary level um, throughout the district. So then taking it a step further, doing a school by school analysis, that was one of the questions, um, making sure that we did that. And we, when we do this every, every time we do an update. Uh, so this is, this is Bethany with the capacity and the 45 day line and the plan developments. And you can see it's pretty constant, um, has been and is predicted to continue to be. Uh, Bethel is next. Now, here's a, a perfect example of where you can't just look at the historical averages. You have to take into account what is coming from a plan development standpoint. Because Bethel, as you can see, if all of the units uh, that are shown in that attendance zone uh, get built, which there's no reason to think that they wouldn't, then you can see what happens to the Bethel attendance zone. Okay. Crowder's Creek, um, 45 day plan development. Griggs Road, same thing. Heinard, historical plan developments. There are some town, there are some developments in the town of Clover that's affecting Kiner. Uh, Larn, this is where the, uh, the majority of the seats are available at the elementary level. It's in Larn. So when you start talking about the issues that are face uh, facing Oak Ridge Elementary, well, it's it's difficult to take those kids and put them in Lauren. It's just so much further away, but that's where the majority of the seats are that are available at the elementary level. And then last, you can see what's uh, what Oak Ridge is facing um, within the next year or two um, by 23 being out of seats. And then next, you look at that at the middle school. So uh, looking at the two middle schools, this is where the 135 and the 45 day lines pretty, are pretty consistent. Uh, the plan development's there with the, with the Dr. Holden cohorts available. And you can see the middle school, total middle school seats are still in the 2425 timeframe as previously reported. The, the issue here is, is more Oak Ridge, as Mr. Largent was talking about earlier than Clover Middle, but Clover Middle was the next one, I believe, Brian. 
Yep. So we have, again, have available seats at Clover Middle, uh, but again, it's just so much further away from Oak Ridge. And then you can see what uh, Mr. Largent's faced with. And then lastly, looking at the high school, um, you can hear talking about the 45 day as, as Dr. Quinn talked about, um, this 45 day line is factoring in those mid-year graduates, which has seen a pretty sizable increase over the last five years, which is why this line is showing such a, a large separation between the 135 and the 45. But you can see at the high school campus now, it is somewhere in the 26 school year. So it is actually sped up. And then just looking at what we call the, the heat maps, but this is just a snapshot of, of the district as a whole. Um, we have three of them. And the reason we have three is because we wanted to be consistent with the reporting of the 135 day numbers that we've historically shown. So this is what the heat map looks like using the 135 day um, enrollments and projections. And it's pretty consistent with what you've previously seen. Uh, Bethany is, is at capacity. Crowders will be soon, and Oak Ridge, of course, is, um, as well as the middle schools. The 45-day um, is where it shows the increase at the high school because of the, the issues that we just talked about, but again, still pretty consistent with the middle, Oak Ridge, and Bethany. Now, I want to just quickly just show you the Bethel, as we talked about. You, you can see Bethel looks pretty good. It's green for the most part, but on the last heat map, again, you take if you take into consideration what construction, what plan developments are coming for Bethel, you can see what happens to it. It, it goes really red quickly. So. And with that, turn it back over to Dr. Quinn. All right, so the key takeaways here um, is in, when you're looking at our 135th day projections, they show the need for additional space uh, by the 2026 20, school year, meaning we will have no available seats if the numbers predict out the way that, that we have planned, and we have been very, very close in our projections, as Dr. Holden said, over the last several years. Um, if it happens that way, by 2026, we'll be out of seats. And as you know, buildings don't get built overnight, so we have a little more time, but we have to plan carefully when that next elementary school needs to come online so that we have seats available. That won't be without some pressure points, even though we've gained the 200 seats, 100 of them at Oak Ridge Elementary School uh, will be filling up pretty quickly. But in the meantime, to get to 2026, we're going to have to do some things, particularly on the eastern side of the district to create some space. Uh, Crowders, Bethel and Oak Ridge will fill up faster and we will need to create space in other schools, potentially looking at attendance lines, looking at things like freezing zones. Uh, those are the kinds of strategies our, our neighbors at Fort Mill have had to, to do and we will have to look at those or maybe bring the extra seats to a building, which is portable units. Uh, that will happen more frequently uh, and probably in the next couple of years on the eastern side of the district as we try to create space space in some of the places like Lauren and Griggs where we have some room. Um, and then finally, again, the plan developments, even though you, you don't place everything on that, you can't ignore that because you saw the impact to Bethel and, and indeed to Crowders as well. Middle school uh, takeaway, 135th day and 45th day are consistent. 25-26 uh, will be completely out of seats. Oak Ridge Middle School is the pressure point um, and we need seats there beginning next school year. Uh, the board will be in February considering some temporary measures to relieve middle school overcrowding, uh, looking at rezoning uh, for Oak, Oak Ridge Middle School students, looking at attendance freezes, uh, or moving portable classes. Um, again, it's really hard to re think about rezoning for Oak Ridge Middle School simply because the distance between Oak Ridge and Clover Middle makes it very hard to move more neighborhoods. So we'll have to look at our options there. And then uh, the reminder that middle school is our pressure points, our stress point, and our building plan that right now. Lastly, with high school takeaway, uh, high school is the fifth largest. Rod talked about fifth through eighth because um, some of the charter schools play into that too. But um, at 26, 17, they're the fifth largest public high school. Uh, if they maximize to 3,100 students, that's what it says we can hold in those in our building, in our high school. 
all spaces will have to be considered. So it won't be a matter of ninth grade campus separate from Clover High. If we have to put 3,100 students in that school, we will have to use every single available room for utilization purposes. Uh, so we won't be able to have a pure ninth grade campus at some point because again, we will need every room to be in use. Uh, the, the 45 day projections look say that we need a high school somewhere in the 2026 uh, or we'll be completely out of seats at that 3100 students and and, and you've heard uh, Mr. Ruth talk about again the core and some of the other stress points and so parking restrooms administrative offices the circulation in the hall all of that will be extremely difficult and we'll have kids changing classes from this campus over here to this campus here because we're going to need every single space to be used. We do at our high school have a program plan where teachers have a planning period in their classroom. And so because of that, three periods of the day, there's students in a class and in one period of the day, there is a planning period. That model is what's producing the utilization that, that we were asking questions about. And I know we've got a slide coming up and, and Mr. Thompson's gonna talk about that. We don't have a place to move our teachers if they don't have a planning period in their classroom. That would be a building need if we had to create spaces for teachers and one fourth of our teachers have to be out of their room for us to use every single solitary room all the time and have 3100 students in every classroom being used every period. Uh, so we could get bigger than 3100 students and use every class every period, but we don't have a place to move our teachers out of their classroom during their planning period to do that. I'm going to let Mr. Thompson really hit that again, but I, I wanted to say that now in case people had to leave. I, I realize it's getting a little bit long, but I wanted to go ahead and get that in. So let's go to the next slide. And we're, we're going to wrap up through um, enrollment and capacity and talk a little bit about next steps. Mr. McCarter, if you would. Um, yes, thank you. I know I uh, appreciate again everyone for being here and I know we want to get to the Q&A and finish up. So we certainly appreciate your time. Some important dates that we would like for you to consider going forward. Um, as you know, when we were as successful as as with the building campaign, some people come up to each individual and, and talk about different aspects of it. And some of the things that I had was what, you know, what are you going to do? What, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? It's like we're going to have to find a solution. That's what we do. We have to find a solution. So we're not going to stop. We're not. We didn't um, pack up and go home. We got back to work and trying to find a solution. That solution is not only with the folks who participated in getting this data, but it's also individuals who are sitting in this room. If we either all move forward together or we're not going to move together. So these dates that are coming up are, are extremely critical for not only everyone that's in this room to participate, but also bring your friends and be and be a viable solution to what we're doing going forward. I think we all can agree that capacity and the growth is here. It's what are we going to do about it and how are we going to adjust to it so Clover, uh, Clover School District can, can, can continue to be the school that we all want to be a part of and this community strives to be a part of and, and go forward. Here are some dates that are important. January the 20th, Town Hall to review justification of building needs. February the 14th, work session which consists of identifying the use of building funds for short-term needs. That's that 35 million that was talked about was going to be, a, um, be applied. Um, that's especially to be focused on um, Bethany, that was a uh, a big concern of what we needed to do, and we can handle that short term with some of these funds. So that's another key important date to participate in. March the 14th is the work session, ident identifying construction options. <clears throat> that's where we talk about if we move forward and how we move forward. Are we going to have a high school that is initially a middle school that can evolve into a high school? Is it a 1200 high school? Where do we build an elementary first? How do we consolidate and move lines? That's that whole conversation that's going to be a part of that meeting. So that's extremely important as well. March 15th through the 3rd is options will be hosted on district websites for review and comments. This is the gathering, data gathering and informational gathering the time period. So participating in those first ones allow individuals to come up with more thoughts, concerns, suggestions, and how to participate in this in that time period of the 15th through April the 3rd. April 4th work session for board deliberations and options. That's how kind of we're going to try to tie this whole thing up and, and put it together so we can go forward with the building campaign. This, this um, schedule is aggressive, so we need everyone to participate. And please invite everyone that you know to be a, a participant in figuring out a solution so we can move forward. Clover School District is a great place to be, so we need your help. Thank you very much, Dr. Quinn.
Right, so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Hopkins to come forward with um, to help us moderate through our questions. He has been checking our CSD communications email to see if there are questions from our guests who are coming uh, live stream. But we also want to start with some of the questions that are here in our, our auditorium. If you see in the front here in the center, we have a microphone so that you can be heard and so that our guests at home can hear you. If you have a question about anything you saw tonight, like utilization type of questions, we have people here who can answer those questions in more detail. If you have something that wasn't presented tonight, and you just really have a burning question and you need to go home with that answer, please don't hesitate. Ask that as well. And then again, Mr. McCarter kind of told you the plans going forward. You might have heard certain meetings where you know you really want to attend that one because that's an interesting session that you've had a, a question about and you're, you maybe want to wait and come to that. However, it, it's up to you. We're open now for that option. So if you would come forward, if you have a question, we'll be glad to take those at this time. Just real quickly, um, we prepared a fact, a question and answer document for everybody tonight. That is the comprehensive list of questions that we gathered from the six listening sessions that we did in December. So we took notes and went back through every meeting every question that came out is what is answered in that seven page document that we prepared for you obviously tonight excuse me we concentrated more on capacity and enrollments so if you have questions pertinent to that that would be right in line with what we presented but we'll certainly answer any question you have um, we will also post this fact uh, online are there any questions i'll be happy to walk to anybody that has questions mark can i start Absolutely. All right. Hi, Ben Thompson here uh, again. I wanted to just uh, address uh, utilization and capacity a little bit before we get uh, get going. It's a really good uh, question to to, uh, to to understand. Uh, actually, we start with capacity. Capacity is a, a real uh, the real driver of how we look at uh, projections uh, overall because capacity is tied to your individual buildings. Without knowing the capacity first, utilization really doesn't matter. Uh, we can't optimize, we can't change, we can't do th things differently. We have to know capacity uh, first. So that is why we spent so much time looking at the capacity of each one of these spaces so that we can understand the capacity first. That's that one to 25 ratio. Uh, when Dale uh, Holden, uh, the demographer, looks at and says words like, uh, uh, building uh, or, or program capacity, uh, what, he's, what he's really talking about is based on those standards, if we apply those standards in each individual school, that is the capacity for each one of those individual schools, even if one elementary school is slightly different or was built in a different age uh, than, than, the, than the next elementary school that's, that's reviewed. So I just wanted to make that very clear is capacity matters tremendously. When we get into utilization, um, obviously that, that program capacity that he's mentioning does not, uh, is not modified uh, whatsoever. It's not modified by flexibility. It's not modified uh, by scheduling. Uh, it is truly the maximum uh, figure that you can get inside that uh, building. And as each one of your principals here, and I'm sure others uh, within the district would attest, is even at the utilization rate that they are in right now, uh, which might be lower than Dale's 100% program capacity, they're starting to feel it. So we wanted to just make sure that anything that we're saying inside of capacity and utilization is actually being translated into the field and we're hearing the same things from these educators uh, as well. I hope that clarifies it a little bit. It is a truly both of those uh, factors are very important capacity being the more important factor uh, of it. Uh, last thing I'll say about utilization is utilization is just a study of how that standard is applied to each and every uh, building based on your current enrollment. It does vary, it goes up and down. Uh, utilization uh, is, is, is looking at capacity first, so it is uh, more of a function of capacity than, than a driver of capacity. Okay. All right, if you introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Brittany Terry. I live in that crowded Lake Wiley area and I have a elementary, middle and high school student. So I understand the needs. Um, I'm just kind of curious where that uh, proposed elementary and high school will be built. 
So the proposed uh, new schools were to be on the Daimler property. That Daimler property is uh, on Hands Mill uh, 274 corridor. Uh, it is a property where we have 174 acres. And uh, it has already been approved by the State Department of Education. The Department of um, Transportation has already begun to review uh, the you look the uh, availability of that school for two school sites. We have done uh, several environmental studies on that property. Uh, we've done a topo study. We've done a geological study. We've done en endangered species studies. Uh, everything, all the indicators. We've looked at utility access to utilities, water, all of that. It is a property that is perfectly suited for the two schools. If we are, have to build two schools in the near future, it will hold that and is being designed for that. And so that is where uh, we have the greatest need based on those projected plan developments, and that is where it's planned to be. Thank you for that question. Okay, all right, let me aim to the wrong side over here. I'll start down here and work my way up, so please raise your hand again. Hi, my name is Kimber Biles. I have currently one child in elementary school, another in the preschool in this area. Um, I moved here in 2019 from Atlanta, so I come from a major city, metropolitan city. I've seen the growth like crazy. I was actually pro-referendum the entire time. I attended the uh, meeting in May, the focus group meeting, and when we broke into smaller groups, I asked the question, are you going to hire a PR and marketing firm to handle this? I was told, the last referendum you did not, you see no need for it. You see what happened. You got crucified on social media. Some of you were personally attacked, and that's not okay. Are there any talks? I have a two part to this question. One, are there any talks moving forward on trying to get professional help in this area so that people are getting the correct information because people outside of the school, people who don't have kids, older people in the community, were confused and they did not get the proper information and they were getting information off Facebook and that's not okay. So do you have a plan for that moving forward? Great question. And we are, the board and I are discussing that uh, part of our meeting on the January 24th. Uh, we're looking at growth positions for next year. This is the time of year where we start to project and think about what we're going to need because got to hire. And uh, I had a very, very positive, strong, wonderful meeting uh, with people in our district who are affiliated with marketing firms or marketing companies. And uh, it was really a brainstorming session about just exactly what you said. Um, what is it that the district needs in terms of making sure its brand is uh, active, viable, that the public really understands what we're doing, that we're communicating and being transparent, and how do we need to make sure that we market those things that are good and that, that we're doing well, and in particularly as we're going forward with this next building plan, if that is what the board decides to do, uh, based on what you've seen tonight, then how can we leverage all of the different ways that we can get information accurately out to our uh, community? So the board will actually be considering growth positions as well as a position that looks at how we market our district. And really more, not marketing, more of a communication position. How do we communicate clearly and get the right tools in the hands of our citizens? Along that, I saw in here that it said you guys reached out to all these different groups, the Lake Wiley Chamber members, Clover Rotary, all that. I'm assuming that was with the survey afterwards? With the survey, we did that. With the listening tours, we asked them to send that out to their constituent groups. With this town hall meeting tonight, they asked that we sent a flyer saying, will you please send this out to your constituent groups? So we really are trying to increase our touch with the community, particularly with those individuals who don't have children who are school age. If you're a parent in this district, you get a lot of calls and information and emails and things from us. If you're not a parent, it is considerably harder without a newspaper to get you accurate information. And it is a two way street. Um, you've got to want to come to some of these meetings or at least tune in live stream. But we need to really leverage social media in more proactive ways. And that's what we're talking about now. Did well. you get positive feedback from these groups that you reached out to? Just curious, I'm not to put you on the spot, but did no, you? No, we, we got lots of positive feedback from those groups. And in fact, I did several presentations for all of those groups. So they were very informed and very willing to send the um, communication pieces out to their constituents. Very helpful, very supportive community groups. Okay, we've got another up here. Hello. And good afternoon, Natalie Berger. We just recently moved in the area, I have elementary 
student. Uh, you did guys a great job on building the suspense and putting us to right directions that schools are needed. So kudos to you, a lot of data. My questions are, what else have you considered besides building in new schools? And also, please prove to us that increasing our taxes is the only option. What else have you done and what will you try to do to offset the burden for us? Thank you. I'll start with that, but I'll be happy to let others please join in. One of the things that we did, and I'm trying to remember if it was March, anyway, it, during the whole, with those 28 meetings, one of the things that the board did is they looked at six different ways we could address growth. Some of it had additions on to schools. Some of it looked at um, using a school one way and then morphing it and changing it into the other. Uh, it looked at a K-8 school, and so we could get a middle school space and an elementary school. I mean, it, there were several different options the, boards look, the board looked at. We want to do that again, this go around. Uh, so we will, that March board meeting that Mr. McCarter was talking about, that's where we'll begin to look at what are all the different ways we could address the problems that you see. Where are the problems was the, tonight's thing. Tonight was where are the problems, and I think you were seeing some of that tonight. The March meeting will be how can we address the problem areas and what are all the different options. In the short run, in February, we're going to be looking at Mr. Largent's building and we're going to be saying, is it mobile units? Is it an addition to his building? Is there another solution that we could do uh, with attendance lines? So all of those things happen first. We definitely will be looking at, at attendance line issues in elementary if we have a little more time before we have to build. So I think if, if you will stay with us and stay through the February and March meetings, you'll get that question answered and, and actually be a part of it with us as we work through the solutions. Any more to add to that question? I want this one. You want this one? Okay. So just really to, to make sure we answer the question fully, you may have been talking about uh, when you said raising taxes, what are the available funding mechanisms for districts? Is that kind of what you're asking? Because uh, there's really only three ways, right? So districts have to either use, use funds they have on hand, which is the 35 million, 8% um, money, which is of all the properties in the district, you can borrow against the 8% or you have to do a bond referendum. So that that's really the only three options. Impact fees. And, and the money from impact fees, yeah, to go towards it. Yeah, good point, thank you. So. Uh, well, quite honestly, um, it, we do in Clover School District have an impact fee, and so any new construction home has an impact fee of four thousand dollars that that the district can collect for growth. So that is that exists now. It has to be used to to build new schools or new spaces for growth, and it can't be for existing houses. So anyone who moves into here to Clover School District in a house that already exists, no impact fee. But if it, we build a new house, there is an impact fee. And so we, we do have that option. That is a funding source. And uh, we are hopeful that we can increase that impact fee uh, down the road, potentially through uh, approaching the county council. That is not the board's decision on that. That is a county council decision. We, we will be glad to, to talk to you about impact fees and what we can and can't do. Again, uh, the decision point is not the board of trustees or the superintendent or, or, or the district. The decision on how to apply impact fees on new developments, and that's the only thing that can be considered in terms of South Carolina law, is uh, at the county council level. Certainly. Thank you very much for that. Next question. All right. My name is Ray Scott. I have a four, fourth grader in Crowder Creek. And as you can see, Crowder Creek is blowing up. I have I like it. First of all, I'd like to ask, are we going to put up another bond referendum 
for these schools to be built. Is that going to happen? That will be decided in the February, March, and April meetings as we talk with you and you work with us and we look at all the options before we, we build. What are the other things we can do? But we have to address pretty aggressive growth. So we will be looking at that. Please, please join us on those meetings. Okay. The other part of this is, by the way, Brian, thank you for being here, Brian Dillon. I love you. He's famous. We hear from him every other day nowadays. Thank you, Brian. Uh, my, my, my biggest question is, and I don't know if we can go back to that slide, Brian, where the, when you guys did the research, the two top issues that we had, can we bring that slide back up, Brian? Oh, the very first slide, the the, the with the, the debris the, from the bond. Yeah, broke up, broke okay. down from the the biggest issue to the second issue down to the last. There were ten issues, but the two top issues were asking for too much. This was too big. Mm -hmm. And the other one was I, I don't remember what it was. It, it's I I was the day of that the day of the vote that we voted for that last referendum that got blown out of the water. Sorry guys, I just it did. I was at the Mason's Lodge down here doing a fish fry. We had three, 400 people come in there. And I literally had people with that little sticker that says, I voted. And they all, not, I shouldn't say all, because it's stereotyping, but a majority of them said, that's way, way, way too much. So what are we going to do to not make it way too much? And two, this lady here talked about a marketing campaign. Why aren't we doing a marketing campaign? It's like an election. You're trying to get your community to buy into something, but you're just throwing out pictures to me. This is what I got pictures and an hour and a half video saying this is what we need. I want our people to buy into it. I have a fourth grader that's going to be impacted huge by what's going on in the next 10 years. We have to have these buildings. We have to have these schools. We have to have these teachers. I know this principal. He's in my neighborhood. I see him around town. He's run over, guys. He's run over. You don't put a Starbucks in town if you're not going to blow up. They have the best civil engineers in the world. It's time to get after it. It's time for us to get our neighbors and our friends in on it. But we need you guys on the school board, the construction company. I don't know if you're involved in it or not, but we need a marketing campaign to get this kicked off. That last referendum got killed. It was terrible, the results. And I think it's because people don't realize how bad we need it. If you live in Lake Wiley, we need it bad. We need it real bad. Well, just to add on to what you said, so we had about 8,000 people, a little more than that, who voted. But we have 35,000 registered voters in Clover School District. We had 8,000 people who voted. 5,000, a little more than that, were no's, and 2,000, a little more than that, were yeses. That's more yeses than we got in the last bond referendum, but a lot more no's than we got in the last bond referendum. We had the highest voter turnout at 8,000 and some this time, and there are 35,000 potential voters. So I agree with you, and that's exactly what our board says. We've got to get the word out more. We've got to make sure people understand it, and we, we own that and, and are excited about moving forward with that. In terms of what we're going to do to make the ask not too big, uh, we have to focus on what we absolutely need. And that's what the board is going to be doing in the February and March sessions is looking at what we absolutely need and starting with that. And we will use uh, to the um, young lady in the back that was asking about all available funding sources. We will use every impact fee fund that we have. We will use every bit of our building fund that we have, and we will see what we have left that we could potentially borrow our 8% borrowing power or what we could ask the public for in a bond referendum, because that's really the only way we can address it. Next question. One question, I'll be right to you, sir. Hi, my name is Stacy. I have three kids in the school district, a fifth grader, a freshman, and a junior. We moved here from Mecklenburg, and if you've seen the news, you can understand why people are moving away from Mecklenburg. And I have to compliment the district in general with how they handle a lot of things with school closures and doing the different things. So thank you. Um, as far as the taxes being increased, I guess my question is I came to one of the previous town hall meetings with my husband and learned that basically it seems to me that it's going to happen. It's just a matter of how it's going to happen. And so for people to say that, you know, they're upset about it, it is going to happen if I'm understanding that correctly. It's just how you're going to get the money and where it's going to come from. But it is going to happen, correct? Well, in, unless it requires a bond referendum that continues to get voted down. I mean, there, there are the 8% borrowing power will get us part of the way there. It won't get you a high school. It's, mm -hmm. there's, we can't borrow enough with that to get a high school. We could borrow enough to, to, to implement an elementary school. 
but that would be a tax increase to you. We borrow against our 8% borrowing power. It hits the debt service and it is, a, it, it is part of what ta taxpayers pay for. Um, but we cannot borrow enough to build a high school without a bond referendum. That's a key piece. They're reminding me to, 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 to say to you that um, the key thing that we did not do a good enough job, I think, in explaining is by moving on the high school, we free this entire building up for a middle school that we don't have to build. The $50 million it takes to build a middle school can be used with our ninth grade campus, but that it requires you to lead with a high school. So whatever the bill is, the ask can't be too much, as Mr. Scott was saying. Whatever the, the amount is of a high school that the district could support, you get a middle school for that cost as well, because we're going to convert that ninth grade campus. And I, we've got to, in your words, market that better and make sure people understand that that is the most uh, fiscally responsible and less of a tax, tax impact way to address the fact that the district's going to need an elementary, a middle, and a high school in the next five years. Clearly, the data is showing that. I will say one more thing, and it's in your FAQ. Um, we projected the interest rate uh, for this bond referendum at 5%. It's very conservative, very high conservative. Um, we just refinanced our 2006 and 2014 bond referendums, uh, and we, were, we received a 1.75% interest rate. If we had gotten that bond through and we had gone to market when we planned on it and got a 1.75 interest rate, the tax increase would have not been 51 mils, as we said that we needed. It would raise from 18 to 51. It would have raised from 18.7 to th approximately 38 mils. So that is a very diff much of a less of a tax increase because the interest rates were so low at the time that that bond referendum was proposed. Uh, so that is, again, another thing that we have to talk about. We'll be talking about costs a lot when we get into the February and March board meeting because we'll be talking about if we build this, what is that going to cost? And okay, well, then what will the tax impact be for that? So a lot of that kind of cost discussions are coming in the next two months as we meet on this. I, uh, I've appreciated everybody, everybody's comments tonight. I think I'm going to segue from Stacy's comment. Uh, my name is Kyle Eller. Uh, I have two kids. I just moved in about eight months ago to the Lake Wiley area. I have two kids, uh, one in elementary school and another in, in preschool. Uh, my wife is also an elementary school teacher at Oak Ridge. Uh, we see the capacity <laughs> issues with, with class enrollments and things like that. But um, my comment obviously is more on the finance side. Um, I, I was very vocal about just making sure that information was presented uh, accurately and fairly for everybody to make an informed decision last September. And I also want to, I want to make the comment here regarding the 8% debt limit that we do have access to. That is access to $32 million currently. That limit will go up over time not only because of the development of accessible real estate in the area, but also the next reassessment in 2024 or 25 will most likely increase values about 15%. Um, frankly, doing a, an 8% debt limit on short-term bonds is very scary for the residents and the taxpayers, short, solely because those millage rates could easily double or triple the bond millage rates could easily double or triple what they are now and would be a fearful reality. Um, this isn't necessarily to voice favor for the bond referendum specifically, but in this sort of debt environment, a, a smaller millage rate over a longer period of time is much more manageable to the taxpayers than would be a short term, one year, two year, three year bond quick debt repayment. Um, that is a major issue to consider, and I do hope that that is considered both by the residents uh, and the board when they begin discussing those options. Um, outside of any impact fee discussions, uh, that there were some previous votes by the county council on that. Um, I suggest you contact the county council representative um, to voice your concerns and any opinions on that. 
Um, hopefully there are, there are conversations uh, and for the future uh, to revisit, if, if possible, to revisit those, those studies and revisit those decisions to see if there are some additional funds um, to consider. But I do wanna congratulate you on the 1.75% refinance. That is a huge reduction in the bond service millage in future years. Um, the savings of at least two to $3 million, even in the first year of that debt service right now uh, is, is massive for the taxpayers. And so there's at least a, a prop for that. But I just wanted to make that comment on, on those short-term bonds. I think that is something, the 8% debt limit is something that the taxpayers probably need to fear a little more than a bond referendum. And I just want, want to be able to discuss those finances openly and transparently uh, with the board and with the taxpayers. 100% agree with you. Um, Clover School District, as a practice, has not utilized its ability to borrow 8% of its assessed value, as you said, about $32 million we could borrow without a bond referendum. We have only done that once in 20 years that I'm aware, and I'm looking around for Mr. Love to confirm my, my number there. Um, is that right? Thumbs up? Yes. We've only done that once in 20 years. Uh, it, as a practice, there are districts all over and around us that borrow in their 8% ability every single year. In other words, they decide we're always going to borrow and keep our debt levy at a certain level because that's what the taxpayers are used to paying. Clover School District borrows when we have a bond referendum. It spreads your payments out over 20 years instead of short-term 8% payments have to be paid back quickly. So you pay it back at a higher rate, pay more money back. And so there are districts that do that every year and keep the tax levy here. We don't, we save our money. We move it over to the building fund. If we've got to fix the roof or the air conditioner, we use the money we have to do that. And so we have not done that. And that is why your debt levy at 18.7 mils is where it was when we were doing the bond discussions with you, is the lowest in York County by far. The next district is 51 mils, 52 mils, sorry, that, and that's Rock Hill. And, and then York and Clover at 85 mils. So by far the least school taxes are being paid by the residents of Clover School District. This bond was gonna jump us up, we thought, to 51 mils. Turns out, because the interest rate was so much better than we projected, it only would have been 38 mils. And so we still would have been by far the lowest. And when we borrow with a bond referendum, again, you pay it back over 20 years. So the impact to the taxpayer is less on the month-to-month -month basis. And that's what Mr. Eller was talking about. And so we certainly want to think about our options going forward. The board will be doing that um, to see what we need to do. Um, the bond referendum is the, the harder step because we got to go back out and get it approved, but, it, but economically it is better for the taxpayers. Any further questions? I'm Jamie Henriksen, I also live on the Lake Wiley Eastern side of the district. Uh, I think one of the issues I heard a lot with the last one, which um, unfortunately, it was from before you were superintendent with the last bond. I think a lot of the residents over there have a mistrust of where the school was going to be built. I heard that multiple times. I saw that in the write-up that you gave us. I understand the intention is the Daimler property, but there was no commitment in the bond. I think if you were to say it was going to be built east of Parham Road or within the Lake Wiley small area plan, you're not committing to that one location if for some reason there was an issue with that location. I think that would help sell it on that side. And again, that was before you were here where that mistrust is coming, um, not your fault. But from years past, there is on that side, I know for sure some, some distrust. And I know the bond went down equally on both sides of the district, but I think wording in the bond stating where that the general district, general area where that school would be not even committing to a specific site would help bridge that gap there. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Any further questions? Do you have questions? Uh, 
I was just wondering um, with the sports, uh, we're now a 5A like division. I was wondering if we'd be downgraded to like 4A if we were to split. That is a really good question. If we were to split somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,800 students to, to 3,000 students, we're already at 2,616, so it's not a far leap to get to 28 to, to, to 3,000. We would split at about 1,400 in each school, and that's 4A. That would be a 4A division. And then we would begin, at, just like with Fort Mill, when Fort Mill split, they were downgraded very quickly and grew so fast they were back up to 5A fairly quickly. And because we're growing, I think it would not be, take long to be back to 5A, but we would initially at least potentially be at a 4A, which puts us in a division, by the way, with York, Catawba Ridge, South Point High School. So lots of schools around us are in that 4A division. All right, thank you. Northwestern now, that's right, Northwestern is now 4A. Okay, um, I have been monitoring the uh, online questions have not gotten any come in. Uh, actually, just had one come in. Um, this question was, in the minutes of the September 27th board meeting, the district's current fund balance was mentioned. It was stated that an excess in revenues over expenditures at year end could be moved to the capital fund balance. From this statement, it is safe for one to assume there is little, if any, excess revenues over expenditures. Why are there not substantial excess revenues over expenditures when the schools are exceeding capacities and not collecting more tax revenue than ever before? This is for Mr. Jim Cosler. I'm not quite sure. I'm going to um, bring it so you can read yeah, through sure. as you answer. Ben, say, can you hand this to? I will say that in general, every every year, at the end of the year, the fiscal year, there is a portion of money that is unspent in our school district. And whatever that portion of money is that is unspent is moved over to our capital building fund. A lot of reason why we have some potential money that is unspent is because it is very hard to predict what our revenue is gonna be when we have so many people moving in, we, we can predict a certain growth rate of that we'll, you know, we think we're gonna, we're gonna get this assessed value. And then when extra people move in, we collect more and that creates a surplus at the end of the year, which we move over. Some of that we move into our district fund balance, our general fund balance, which supports our um, AAA bond rating. When you have a, a solid fund balance that operates for two months operating in case something were to happen catastrophically with funding. So some of it goes to what we call the general fund balance, but the rest of it goes to the building fund balance. And we have moved anywhere from uh, 3 million to 5 million uh, upwards of those numbers over from our uh, general operating fund to our building fund because more revenue came in through taxes than we predicted when we did our budget way back in June. So we have to do our budget in June. We don't get our tax collections. Most of those come in beginning in January and in February. So we're predicting, we always predict conservatively because we don't want to have too little money and not be able to make payroll. And so when we get more funding in, we move that to our building fund and we have done that consistently. And that is how we make repairs. We purchase land, we um, have money to put down and, and decide that's that where this 35 million comes from. That's what we use it for. Now we're going to use it to address building needs. So it's just repurposing that money from operating into what we need for capital. Think that answered the question? I hope so. If anyone else wants to try. Yeah, so what um, Mr. Thompson is basically saying, what also happens every year when you're a growing district is you have more students and therefore you have more teachers. And 86% of our budget is payroll. 86% of our budget is payroll. So when Mr. Ruth was talking this morning or this, after, this evening, he said, I'm going to ask for seven teachers next year. And he knows he's being aggressive and he did that in public. I'm just really going to have some words with him over that. That's what he wants. He wants the principals in the audience out there laughing because they know we are very, very tight about how many teachers we can add each year. And it really is based on how many students do you have? What, what are they taking? How many classes is that going to be? Do you need another English teacher? Can you share a teacher here? Can we move? I mean, we do everything we can, but when you're growing by 250 or more students a year, 
you're going to have an impact on te teachers that are needed, teacher assistants that are needed, uh, nurses that are needed, guidance counselors. That, I mean, it's, it is a ripple effect. And so our operating budget has, goes up every single year. It was 93 million last year. It's 97 million this year because of additional, primarily additional personnel needed. Okay, uh, Mr. Jim. Line. Okay, he had a follow up question. Why are revenues not exceeding expenditures? They should be substantially higher seeing as there is school crowding. I, th I think you just outlined that expenditures, we have more revenue than expenditures, which creates our fund balance, correct? Correct. And Mr. Love, do you want to tr to take an opportunity to come up on the stage to make sure we're answering his question? I've, I'm trying to, there may be an angle that I'm not seeing in the question. Gee, as soon as I get Mr. Love, okay. I'm coming to you, Mr. Love. Thank you, Mark. We do have more revenues than we have expenditures in the average year. And it's, it's planned that way in the sense of managing a very conservative budget on the revenue side. The same thing in managing the expenditures on the expenditure side. And whatever is left is added to the general fund operating balance, as you mentioned, anything in excess of a budget balance for the next year of 25% of the unencumbered fund balance is transferred to the building fund. And it has been over the last five or six years, occasionally the three to five million that you mentioned that's transferred to the building fund that's now available for the board to appropriate for renovations and expansion and those kinds of things that they'll be discussing. I think the angle that we are considering that he's asking, I, there might be a misunderstanding that when you get more students, more taxpayers, we, that we get more operating money, and that is not true. On your home, the district does not generate any operating dollars. On your car, yes. On investment properties, yes. But Act 388, if you look at your tax bill, you can see a line called school operations and you'll see a, a, a dollar amount there. And then you will see tax credit because Act 388 took all taxes from homeowners away from school districts. And so that is that we don't get any more operating money. So when we have to have more teachers, we have to guess what? Raise the millage and that impacts our businesses. That impacts our small businesses because they do pay operating taxes and you pay operating taxes on your vehicles, your boats and those types of things, but not on your home, which was before Act 388, a very stable funding source for the district. We got one more question over here to this gentleman. Thank you. Um, my name is Dave Edwards, and I have been in Clover since 1968. I have two students that graduated from the Clover School System. Uh, I have two. I have two children that have graduated from the Clover School System. I have three grandchildren that have graduated from the school system, and I have two great grandchildren that are currently in the school system. Do we see any uh, any kind of relief? Uh, capacity relief from a 12 month school system. Um, we talk about that a lot um, when we were talking about all the options. So what I think you might be suggesting is if we went year round, yes. all, all 12 months, could we see a relief? Possibly. Yeah. If we used every building all 12 months, all, I think it's called trimester scheduling. Mr. Britton, do you want to speak to it? So the, the principle behind doing the trimester year round is a little different, but uh, you divide a student body into to three at any given time. Two of those groups are uh, in school. So uh, effectively, you can increase your capacity uh, by uh, artificially we increase it by extending the school year. And it's, it's used uh, occasionally, not very much. Uh, generally, it's 
pretty unpopular with the public because of uh, parents having not aligning summers because a third of your group will have a summer uh, in the fall uh, or their break would be in the fall. Another would be in the spring. The other would be where it typically would be. So uh, it, it is a, a method that's been used. Uh, I've been involved with uh, some districts that have uh, considered it, uh, strongly considered it, but I've not been involved with um, a district that uh, is actually implemented. I don't know, Ben, if you have or. I haven't been involved in a trimester system. All, all I know, though, uh, just from how you use from a capacity standpoint is uh, that is more about utilization, meaning, uh, and I think the word optimization was used uh, tonight, which goes hand in hand with that, is uh, to get there, it is a true culture shift. Um, really, you have to change a lot of the things that the school district is doing and doing well. Uh, just from an educational uh, standpoint and a management standpoint before it even gets to trickle down uh, into building capacity and, and utilization. Uh, moving to that model would would see, would probably increase your utilization, not guaranteed, but probably. Um, and it, but it would also uh, change your culture tremendously uh, as well. I hope that answered your question. It, it does. Thank you. Yes, sir. And then I will add several years ago before Dr. Quinn was here, we did a little and Mr. McCarty, you may remember we talked about a potential year round calendar and um, it was a very polarizing issue when it went to the community. Um, you got the folks that, that want to maintain the tradition of the of the summer and those that were ready to move forward. So that, that can be as polarizing as the bond issue was itself. So um, we have one more question that has come in from a Mr. Michael player. And uh, his question is, how is it determined that 25 students per class was acceptable at the elementary level? My daughter is in kindergarten at Crowder's Creek. There are 26 students in her class, and there's no way that it is conducive for learning to be fair to the teachers. Great question. Uh, the 25 to 1 is only at kindergarten. It's 22 to 1 at the other grade levels. And in Title I schools, it's 20 to 1 at those other grade levels. The rationale is that there are two teachers in the room at the kindergarten class. There's a teacher and a TA. So you can go slightly higher in your ratios. Uh, we don't like to get to 25 to 1, and we just added an extra teacher to Crowder's mid-year. The board gave us a growth position mid-year this year to address the fact that Crowder's was at 26 and 27, I don't think they reached 28 in any of their kindergarten classes, but it absolutely is too high. And we have, and we agree with you on that. Uh, so we just put a teacher in mid-year. Now we've got to hire that teacher. And it's, as you can imagine, not a lot of teachers <coughs> are letting teachers out of their contract. So we do have someone coming and it's going to be uh, later this month, but we don't like to get to 25, but we, we consider that as the top of the ratio for kindergarten. I'd love for it to be lower. It's just going to be a space issue. And kindergarten is expensive because, again, it, it's two teachers that, by law, I have to have in that room, and it's a bigger classroom. So if we go lower on our kindergarten ratios, which would be a gift, and our elementary teachers would do a happy dance, um, then we have to consider the space impact on that. Part of the reason why we picked up 200 seats when we did this re study or re uh, update is we did go up on our class size ratios so that. We can be a little tighter, and that was trying to be fiscally responsible. Uh, so again, if we lower it, which we would love to do, it's going to increase our operating costs for more teachers, and it's going to require the space. Okay, that's the, that concludes the number of questions that we have from the outside, but I did want to make the point that we had 48 visitors online for tonight's uh, meeting. Uh, Mr. Eller had one more question he'd like to follow up with. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I I know we haven't really utilized, uh, I think, some of our st statistical uh, representatives uh, that are up on stage. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are, you're, you are with the, the modeling of the Tischler Vice study that said that every, every household, the average student addition was 0.431. Um, with that study and with the projected enrollment growths, could any of you speak to the statistical assumptions or the confidence um, that is in those enrollment projections, just from the idea that anecdotally, I've got 70 homes in my neighborhood and we have roughly 1.2 to 1.3 students in K through 12 per household. Obviously that's a small sample size for a district that's gonna grow to roughly 16,000 units. Um, 
but what I see in the Lake Wiley area seems to beat the 0.43 number. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping to to get a little more information on the the enrollment projections and where that where the confidence lies in those in those numbers um, and just comment on the appreciation of Dr. Holden um, at least revisiting those projections as each year comes to fruition. I will not attempt to justify the statistics on that, but I will put <laughs> you in touch with Mr. Vice. He will be glad to, but I will tell you why I think you're probably accurate that it's lower. We had to provide this data to Tischler Vice in 2018 to prepare for the impact fee discussion because that took us 18 months. That the impact fee discussion took us a long time to get it to the final line. So we were doing the, the study in 2018. A lot has, not a lot has changed, but growth has accelerated in Lake Wiley since 2018. And his statistical basis was the years prior to that. So 10 years prior to that, that was be calculated into his statistical analysis. We weren't growing as fast as we were growing in the last five years, which is why when Mr. Clayton was doing his 135 day projections and 45 day, he used the last five years as a baseline to predict growth because we're growing at a faster rate right now. So I actually think you're hundred percent right, but I don't want to speak to the statistical modeling. I would love for him to do that. And then when we redo that study, which we will have to do five years from when we achieve the impact fee, I think that number will be different. I really do. Just anecdotally looking at the growth. All right. We have another question. Y'all have done a great job, by the way, this is a fantastic, um, presentation and my question sort of piggybacks off the the, the marketing question of the uh, concern the lady had down front this again this is a great presentation and there is that percentage or overwhelming majority the negative vote out there what measures are going to be taken to get this presentation I know it's live streaming and all of that what measures are going to be taken to get this information to that sector of our population and and to continue to to draw in those folks and get that word to them we've had a lot of ideas and some of them include and we've already acted on some of these um, we have an opt-in uh, site on our website for if you're a community member and you don't have kids, but you want to get all of our district publications, all of our district emails and not all of our phone calls because you wouldn't certainly want all of those. But if you want information from the district, click that link, sign up and you will now be on our distribution list. If we had a distribution list of every citizen in our district, that would be great. We only have our parents. And so that's part of, it, of our issue. Uh, we, we are going to utilize our school signs more strategically to let the public know when we're talking about things and doing things. We are going to look at how we increase our social media presence. That is now how people get their information. Uh, we are trying to reach out to different administrators of a lot of these neighborhood, I think they're called next door pages. I'm not on a next door page, but several people are. And so how do we work with the administrators of those pages? And, and when we, when the board deliberates in February, and let's, let's assume for a minute, we're gonna talk about Bethany and really think about things at Bethany. How do we news blast that out? So people in our Bethany community and all of our community know, hey, these are the things that's gonna go on in Bethany for, in the next two to three years. So those are the things that we are talking about. And we, I do think we're gonna need some additional help. We, uh, Brian is, is a fantastic PIO, but he is an office of one. And we are a growing school district and we need some support and help in, in getting that out. So thank you for that question. Okay, last chance. If there's another question, I'll be happy to take it. All right. Hi, I'm Brianna Clausen. I have uh, one child in kindergarten and one in a pre-K program. Um, lived here my entire life, grew up in Bethany, very familiar with that school, graduated from high school here, um, raising my children here. So longtime resident, love the school district, um, love everything that you guys have put together. Um, is there any way in the future, like when we put this back together, can we more accurately have a millage rate that 
Like, I mean, I think the 50 scared some people. It and did. so if you could have put it out there at 38, it went, and I don't know, maybe that's not possible. Um, maybe that could have brought some people down. <laughs> I think that's a very valid point. Um, we, when we are projecting a tax increase, we tend to project it conservatively and we don't know, it goes to bid. And so we don't know the interest rate we're going to get. So we predicted it at 5%. We thought it would come in less than that, but we wanted to bring that happy surprise to you when it came in less than that. And so, but you're right. I, I, when you predict too conservatively, perhaps then you get a number that does scare scare people. So yes, we've got to work on that. We do plan to work on that. Uh, I think it's a very valid point. And, and likewise, if you undervalue that, you have to come back for more. Yeah, if we had said, oh, we're going to get a, you know, 1% interest rate, and then we got something higher, then you would have gotten more tax and you wouldn't have been happy with us there either. So we've got to find that sweet spot in terms of predicting that. I think if you can break it down by the household, that 51 million, even with conservative 5%, the expectation is X amount percent on your tax increase over the next 20 years, that might be easier because majority of people is, what is it for me? It so is that my help? And it will also show different perspective of that 51 million. Thank yeah, it, it is confusing. And so um, in the last week of the bond, we produced a video on how do you read your taxes and how do you understand what this will really mean to you? Very well done video. Marketing again, how do you get that out to everybody so that they see it and understand it? Uh, so it was not 51 million, it's 51 mills. That's the millage. And that's a little bit different. Each mill is about, Mr. Love, 340,000. Price of a mill, debt service mill. Okay, so when you go up from 18 mils to 51 mils, each mil about 400,000, that was producing a, a tax increase that, that some of our, our constituents were scared, but we ended up not needing to have to go that high because we got a better interest rate. So I, I, to your point, that's, we've got to really look at how to explain that and how to predict that accurately without, Doc, without under predicting it so you're angry. Yes. Dr. Quinn, uh, I'm Jeff Ledford. I live here in Lake Wiley. I don't have any kids in the school district. I've just been a big fan. Um, I want to compliment you and, and the board on it's obvious to me that that you all have heard the the message and, and you're going about it a different way. And I think it's right on point. Um, it's obvious you've already accomplished some preliminary studies on the Daimler property in anticipation that we'll have one or if not two schools built there. So have you, based on the, the calculations of uh, full capacity and all that, have you worked backwards? Okay, how long does it take to build this elementary school? How long does it take to build this high school? Therefore, we're going to need to have this resolved by the fall of 22 or 23. Do yes, you have can. that? And I would let the experts do that other than myself. Uh, part of our original facility assessment, uh, we included um, typical time frames and schedules to develop uh, facilities um, and elementaries in uh, the, these are kind of a slot um, about 33 months, 28 to 33 months for an element from the time you have funding from the time you start designing from turning it over to the architect. They do programming um, site analysis, full engineering. There's ways to expedite. You can do some multi prime bidding or where you're doing an early site package. Uh, or you can break components out. You can do different delivery methods. Um, construction management at risk where you bring the contractor on early. Uh, middle schools tend to be a little bit longer just because they're larger. Um, so you're uh, about 36 months, generally speaking. Um, and then high schools, those are very specific. You're about 12 months in design and 30 to 36 months in construction. But the you know design and procurement, you got you know you got to go follow the state procurement code. Long story short, 
there there is a typical slot uh, and um, for each type of school. When we talk to um, and if you'll you see that was it 2019, it it identified. Uh, you know, you don't want to be ringing the bell the day you've run out of seating. You want to be ringing the bell three years before you run out of seating. And, and you know, it, forecasting is is not an, a perfectly accurate process. That crystal ball that will get kind of cloudy at five years out. But if you're managing five years out and in, you you generally can. If you miss it by you know uh, six months, you're still in the slot to to be successful and to to accomplish being proactive and having seats available before you need to have those seats available. So that's the intent. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. Uh, so I think the middle school, we need we, the process is we're behind the eight ball on the, on the middle school, uh, which is the pressing matter. Yeah, that, that, that's accurate. Yeah. Right, 20. If, if the bond had passed in 2021, the schedule that we had was to open an elementary in 24 and a high school in 25, which falls in the, the slot and falls in line with about four years on that high school. That still would have been three extra years that Mr. Largent had to deal with the overcrowding issues at Oak Ridge Middle. Um, but again, as we talked about earlier, building that high school saves you a building. It saves you having to build a middle school to help that issue out. It's just that it would have stressed the middle school seat issue for an additional two years. Because um, those seats are needed in 22, 23, and it, and it would have been 25 before that relief would have been felt. That makes sense. Any more questions? Okay, I'm going to shoot it back over to you, Dr. Quinn. You have been an amazing audience. You've stuck around for a long time for a lot of data. I hope it was worth your time. We greatly appreciate your time. Looking forward to seeing you next month. Um, February 14th is our next. We'll spend Valentine's Day together. Come and join us as we start to look at our short-term plans and uh, be safe getting home. Uh, weather's going to come in tonight, but I think you'll be safe at this point. And thank you all for being here. District office, district office. Thank you.